Hi, and welcome to Sustainability Explored. Every week, this podcast navigates a new topic through interviews with the most disruptive minds in sustainability, turning their experiences working behind the scenes into actionable advice you can implement and use in your life, no matter your background. My name is Anna. I am an environmentalist, sustainability consultant, and the host of this show. We continue our season seven with an exciting interview on zero waste lifestyle. Many of you has, have asked me about it, and I, I decided to invite a specialist, a professional in the sphere. We will be talking about how anyone can start from where they are and make a difference in the world. Today with us, we have Kelly Eklund, the owner of two earth conscious companies. She started her first company, Bestowed Essentials, just three years ago at the age of 23. It's now the largest soap making company in South Dakota. She has a goal of bringing back the idea of circular economy. It's not her only mission. Her business model includes activism, empowering the voices of others, especially women and people of color. I'm super ha happy Kali joins us at Sustainability Explored. And in a second, I will be ready to welcome her. Kali, hi. I am super happy to welcome you on Sustainability Explored podcast. And you are the first guest with whom I will discuss zero waste lifestyle. Many of my listeners ask me, oh, can you talk more about the individuals and, and what can we do as individuals to help the earth, to help the planet, to help the environment? And finally, you are here to tell us what to do. I'd really love to start with your own way in sustainability and a little bit about your background and how your career evolved. <laughs> Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. And um, well, the the story of my career has definitely taken some some twists and turns that I wasn't expecting. Um, I was previously a translator in the U.S. Navy, and uh, yeah, um, how quite different quite different from what I do now. Definitely. Um, while I was in the Navy, um, I actually discovered soap making as a uh, hobby. I found it to be very therapeutic, very relaxing, and got into that and was making soap for all of my friends, you know, giving it to them. And they were like, okay, we've got like three years worth of soap. We're good. You should try selling this. Um, and so I started selling my soap on Etsy and at the local farmer's market on Saturday. And um, after I got out of the military, I decided to give myself one year to see if I could make a, a business out of, out of making and selling soap. And I was able to. And so you know, today, um, my manufacturing business is the largest handmade soap company in the state of South Dakota. We're actually moving to our first warehouse um, in nine days, which is so exciting. Um, but during that time frame, as I was getting my, my business started up, my manufacturing business, um, I watched a documentary on Netflix called A Plastic Ocean. And I had always considered myself to be pretty eco-friendly. You know, I grew up in California and Oregon, which are very progressive. Recycling was normal to me. Um, and I was definitely shocked when I joined the Navy and moved to other parts of the country where the culture um, and the mindset was completely different and things that I grew up uh, having normal weren't, um, were so uncommon in, in other parts of this country. Um, but so when I watched A Plastic Ocean, it, it just kind of blew my mind at the amount of trash in our oceans. And I had already been what I had considered eco-friendly in my business, but realized that I had so much more work that I could be doing. And so that's when I really um, decided to make zero waste part of my business model. And, you know, having that uh, triple bottom line of people, planet and profit. Um, so yeah, and then fast forward, uh, late 2019, we opened up the first zero waste store in South Dakota. And um, yeah, it, it's been an interesting year in 2020, for sure. <laughs> Things are pretty rough there. For, yeah, for a I was bit, just but... going to say that with the soap company, you should be so much on time with this COVID-19 unfolding and 
uh, WHO telling people to wash their hands as mm. as much as possible, as often as possible. How is it? How was your business affected by COVID nineteen? Well, my manufacturing, both businesses, of course, were very affected. My manufacturing business saw about 80% of its sales drop right away because we sell to stores um, and all those stores were closing down. And, uh, you know, most of them tried to figure out how to start selling online if they weren't already. Um, There's a few of our stockists that did end up closing permanently um, and weren't able to make it through. And so because, um, because we sell wholesale, because we sell to other businesses that were also very affected, um, that, was, that was devastating for us for a few months. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the beginning of the pandemic was, was really rough. Wasn't quite sure if we were gonna make it through for a while, but then business has just exploded um, since August and, and we just haven't even been able to keep up um, and then with our store, we, we also had to close our, our brick and mortar store. But luckily, we already had online sales. Um, and so we were able to pivot to focus completely online uh, a lot easier. And, and that definitely got us through those mm-hmm. first few months until we were able to reopen. Right. We have, I think, one or two um, zero waste stores here in Kiev in Ukraine. And I was always asking myself, but I didn't ask the owners, how do they survive? Because people don't go there and shop regularly. You know, it's they sell Mm -hmm. in particular the um, products that are meant to last longer. Loofahs to instead of sponges, I don't know, um, bamboo toothbrushes. Well, that's that's probably doesn't serve you longer than a plastic Mm -hmm. one. You still have to replace it. How is a business that is meant and is very um, sustainable and long, like you sell long-term products, products that are, that have a longer life cycle. What's going on? Where, where the money is coming from? You have more customers to, to meet your own like financials, financial goals or open the curtain to that secret. (laughs) Of course. Yeah, that is always a a difficult uh, situation as a sustainable store owner. We do sell a significant amount of reusable products that last a lot longer, don't need to be replaced as often. Um, We also sell a lot of refillable things, though. So, you know, there is a lot of stuff that people do need to come in and get more of every month or so. And that's, you know, their body soap, their laundry soap, their dish soap, their shampoo, um, we sell ingredients for people to make some of their own DIY recipes. Um, so that, that helps get us um, repeat customers in the door pretty often. And then it is about, yeah, just trying to get more new people in the door. Um, so there's always an education aspect of running a, a zero waste store, telling people about the climate crisis and plastic pollution and why it's important to buy um from small businesses and locally and ethically made. And um, so, yeah, always trying to uh, trying to educate people and, and get new people in the door for the first time and, and trying out what we have, showing them that it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be expensive. We have something for everybody to get started wherever they're going. Where would you suggest the person who is just wondering about it, you know, zero waste sounds so easy and so complex at the same time well i cannot refuse certain plastics even the plastic Mm -hmm. containers um i have delivered before COVID, when it was still legal to to deliver speeches in front of uh, big groups i had a couple of workshops for the students and i remember one uh teacher of theirs stood up oh what are you telling us zero waste shopping how do you buy your uh, meat for example meat and fish that if not in the plastic bag i said i have a container i dare you it's it, it must be plastic container yes it is plastic container you don't have to throw away everything that is plastic that you use in your home however right now you don't find a single plastic bottle in my bathroom because I use solid shampoo, I use only solid soaps, don't have the liquid one. What, how do you think and what based from you on your your experience, where do 
people start? What would you tell them? Start small, start <laughs> with where you are. But I'm wondering, even for myself, I'm not at all perfect yet. I'm wondering what would you suggest um, to others, individuals that are into zero waste and minimalism? Where can they start? Well, this is the first time I've been asked that question um, for an international audience, actually. And I, I recognize that American consumption habits uh, seem to be drastically different from a lot of our <laughs> overseas counterparts. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where, you know, where your audience might already be consuming things in a different way than, than what most of my American peers do. Um, but I do think a good place for, for anyone to start, and it's going to be a very weird place, is to start by looking at your trash bag right now. Like, open it up, see what's in your trash bag. That's going to tell you exactly where you need to start. Um, for instance, are you going through a lot of, you know, like food delivery containers or um, are you Empty. using a lot, yeah, <laughs> a lot of paper towels? Um, are you using a lot of um, <clears throat> maybe like plant milk containers that you're buying from the store? Maybe you could start making that plant milk, nut milk, you know, dairy-free milk, whatever you want to call it. Maybe you could start making that at home or with those paper towels, just switching to using, you know, reusable rags, uh, washcloths, whatever. Um, so, so look at your trash and see where you as an individual need to make a change. What is the most common item in there and how could you, you don't have to eliminate it, of course, but how could you reduce the frequency of, of that type of item? Um, and then what you mentioned with using solid shampoos and solid sh uh, soap, and you mentioned a bamboo toothbrush earlier. And, um, you know, there's a lot of really easy, sustainable switches like that. And perhaps you don't need, uh, you know, 10 different cleaners for your, for your home. You don't need 10 different cleaning liquids. You can um, most of the time use soap and, uh, or baking soda or white vinegar. You know, there's some very simple key ingredients that I think are important that you can do a lot with. Um, and they're going to be much more affordable than, than buying 10 different cleaners. Um, so th it really depends on, on where you're at and what you've got going on in your life. And I'm all about meeting people where they're at. You know, it is not one size fits all. Um, it needs to be individualized because our lives are all so individualized. So Absolutely. figure out what works best for you and make those small changes. And also one more caveat to that too, is that um, the trash that you're producing or the packaging that you're using is important, but it's not the end all be all. What you mentioned earlier with like meat and fish and everything, you know, one of the best ways that you can cut down on your carbon footprint, one of the best ways that you can help the environment is to actually cut back on the amount of animals that you're eating. Um, it's also really good for your health to eat a more like plant-based whole foods diet um, with minimal meat and fish and dairy products. So that's always something to consider as well here. Um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's international, but we have this whole thing called meatless Monday. And so, you know, one day a week where you don't eat meat and then the rest of the week you eat like normal, but it's also a really great way to, um, to get back in the kitchen and to try some new recipes, try things that you haven't tried before. So that's not a great place to start. Yes, that's what we are doing now. Uh, trying to cut on deliveries because it honestly pains me. The containers are always plastic and it's quite a mm -hmm. solid plastic yet single use and it's not recyclable. And uh, where I am at, we don't have recycling facilities for real. But, you know, when I tell my grandma, oh, you should, um, you know, we're, we're trying to use uh, shoppers, we're using spider bag or net bag to mm -hmm. go uh, grocery shop. And she's like, what are you telling me? We've been living like that for our whole life. Exactly. It's only in the recent yeah. years. Exactly. It's only in the recent years that um, we saw the rise of plastic bags. And now, okay, they're good. No, back, they're bad. <laughs> I remember when I was little, um, my grandfather would come from the bazaar, from the market, using this uh, net bag. 
And I was, my only question was, why does everybody have to see what we have? <laughs> what are we carrying? What is in our bag? And I see that people look at me even here in a progressive country, a big city, capital city. Like, why are you showing us all that what you bought in the supermarket? But I think it's important. I guess uh, more and more people are adopting this uh, lifestyle that our grandparents, my grandparents lived without mm. even knowing the troubles of, you know, plastic, ocean pollution, and so on. How is it in the US? Do you see more people um, riding the wave of uh, zero waste <laughs> lifestyle? I think it very much depends on where you are in the US. Um, I, I think this country is is quite divided amongst its people on, on a lot of different things and um, environmentalism is definitely one of them. So in, in more progressive places, yeah, you, you see a lot of people who are conscious of, of their waste and of, of their carbon footprint. Um, but in plenty of other places around the country, you see people that, that uh, it isn't a priority for, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But based on what you see, uh, how your business operates and from where people uh, order, if it's not brick and mortar store online, what, what are the trends? What are they interested in? <laughs> um, well, I do know like our, our top five states that we send orders to is California, uh, Florida, New York, South Dakota, and Texas. Um, so we definitely send um, orders to cities more than rural areas, which is very reflective of... of um, the issues as, as well and, and voting demographics and that type of thing. Um, I think uh, a lot of people want to start with the, the easy stuff, you know, a bamboo toothbrush, a solid soap bar, a natural loofah instead of a plastic loofah, those reusable shopping bags or produce bags instead of plastic ones. So those are some of the items that, that we sell the most. And then, you know, even just, um, toothpaste in a glass jar instead of a plastic tube or um, toothpaste tablets. We actually started stocking those recently and, and those have been a big, big hit. People love how convenient they are. So um, it definitely it changes too. We're always introducing new products and, and so lots of, uh, lots of different shopping patterns that can be very hard to keep up with. What was one item the hardest for you to replace in your home? Ooh, what a good question. Um, conditioner was definitely hard for me, hair conditioner. Um, I've finally been able to find a company that sells it in a metal bottle, um, but it's not the greatest conditioner. You know, I wish it was a, a better product for my hair. Um, but I, I live very minimally, like <laughs> very, very minimal. I used to live in a camper van actually and, and drive all over the country. So I'm used to having very, very few belongings and, and living quite simply. Um, so being in a, in an apartment again, right now during this chapter of my life has, has been a transition for me. Um, I think the, the biggest things that I spend money on are books, plants, and candles. Um, and so, oh. you know, books, luckily I can get secondhand and, um, plants I can get, you know, uh, cuttings from my friends' plants and, you know, start new ones from those baby plants mm -hmm. and clearance ones, but candles, maybe, maybe candles are, are hard to find really eco-friendly, but they're such a guilty pleasure of mine. It's true. What life is if not, if we do not allow ourselves some guilty pleasures sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. I know that your business is also socially oriented. You said mm -hmm. you want to give voice for two women of uh, two women in general, then people of color. Can you expand more a little bit on that? Who is working in the store? Who is uh, in the support group of online store? And and why this idea? And why do you think it's important? That's probably the biggest question. Oh. Well, why isn't it important? <laughs> I, no, I, want, I know, I yeah. totally share your opinion. I want you to, to tell me, not, not even me. I, we have listeners from more than 100 countries. Mm -hmm. They are mostly coming from 
the biggest shares are from France and the US, and then uh, it goes Ukraine, Russia, UK, Germany, and so on. But we have people from the countries I haven't even heard of, I swear, like mm -hmm. islands, um, we have yeah. Fiji, San Lucia, Ethiopia, Pakistan, not everywhere uh, in the world, people have the same opinions about feminism, um, employment of women, even though, you know, me on my personal little family level, we see that it's a blessing to be both working to allow ourselves more because not you know, I don't sit on my husband's neck. He's not sitting on my neck. We're both equally partners. Mm -hmm. And I, I like sustainability and like zero waste, like minimalism. I cannot understand how we collectively didn't see it before and why at all we were living in a different way. Just, yeah, and people around me, what am I telling? <laughs> not, not before in years, before... Uh, like uh, in this collective state of mind. So why um, in your business, <laughs> what is going on? Well, because to me, you know, why, why would I do it any other way? That's just how I see it. Why, you know, I am a um, very progressive um hardcore feminist. I believe that women are equal to men. I believe that uh, we deserve to be treated the same and employed the same and paid the same. I believe that people of color deserve all of those same opportunities. I believe that people with disabilities deserve those same opportunities. Basically, I believe that everyone deserves a good life. I, I believe that no one should suffer. Everybody should have their basic needs. So that, that makes me pretty normal in some countries and uh, very uh, radical Rebellious. in other countries. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, like you said, definitely depends on, on the country and, and how their views differ. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud of the team that I have. I've got an incredible team. And for my manufacturing business, we employ people of all abilities so we've got a, a wide range, people with physical abilities, um, people with, um, with, with all, all different types, neurodivergent. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's just hard for me to answer that question because for me, it's, it's normal, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, in, in different parts of the world, it's, it's unfortunately not normal um, to, to provide employment to women and provide employment to, to people of color and people of different abilities. Um, so we are a, a majority female team. We have a few, uh, a few men on our team as well. And, um, yeah, like I said, I, I'm, I'm very proud of my team. They're, they're great people. And I think that, um, I think that diversity is so important. I think that the more, uh, different backgrounds and different experiences, uh, and different thought patterns that you have on your team, the, the more new creative ideas you're going to get. And um, it, you know, it's, it's great to see a, a, a lot of different type of people coming together and, and working on a, a, on a common goal. So, you know, we're all about just trying to, trying to be the change that we want to see in the world. That's what we're working towards every day, both in my manufacturing business and in my retail store. Um, just educating people and getting involved in the community and doing the best that we can. It might be small because we're a very small business, but doing the best that we can every single day. Beautiful words. Totally agree. How big is the team? Um, I have six employees right now. And then I've actually got one person in helping for the holidays too. That's temporary. Mm -hmm. I cannot help but ask you how to make your own soap. I've been circulating <laughs> around this question since the beginning. <laughs> well, um, soap is comprised of three primary ingredients, and that's either like oil or lye or uh, oil or fat, and then you need water or some other type of liquid that contains water, and then you need lye. Which, if you are making solid soap, there's two types of lye. If you're making solid soap, you need uh, sodium hydroxide, and that makes the solid bar. But if you want to make liquid soap, you need potassium hydroxide. 
And they're both called lye, but that's what makes a solid versus a liquid soap. Um, and, you know, for, for us, both of my businesses are completely vegan and cruelty free. So we don't use any animal fat or animal products at all in our, our products. We use vegetable oils. Um, we use water most of the time, but sometimes we'll do like um, a cucumber puree or pumpkin puree, which just give you the most beautiful, vibrant, natural colors. Absolutely stunning. Um, you can add in different herbs. You can definitely add essential oils for fragrance or artificial fragrance oils. We also, we don't use any, any artificial ingredients. So we stick to the natural mm -hmm. essential oils for fragrance. Um, you know, and you add stuff like uh, turmeric makes a uh, yellow soap and a natto seeds also make yellow soap. A natto is what you'll commonly see used in cheddar cheeses for that vibrant mm -hmm. orange color. Yep. Um, if you use um, hemp oil, it gives your soap a very natural green color as well as cucumber. And um, so there's, there's so many different ways. I, I like to refer to soap making as it's definitely, it's both a science, but it's also an art. You can get so creative and you can make just the most beautiful patterns. And I highly recommend getting into soap making as a, as a hobby if you're looking for something. Um, I find it to be very relaxing and I, I love it enough that I, I made a business out of it. So it's, it's definitely this a, a great crazy. passion. I'm going to try. I swear I'm going to try. Yeah. Here's the question that I have. You know, since now we have this problem with plastic waste, penetrating everything they found microplastics in the alps in the air uh -huh. in the mountains obviously in the ocean and apparently we didn't see that coming or somehow omitted that potential problem in your opinion why why zero waste is becoming increasingly popular i want to believe around the world by the way have you read the book um, zero waste home uh, bea johnson is the author i haven't read it but I've, I've heard a lot about it yeah i feel like it has started from the u.s she's a u.s citizen she's a french lady mm -hmm. uh, yep. who married um, an american and she lives somewhere mm -hmm. in the u.s california yeah Oh, you see? Yes. And she started promoting it. Uh, she even came to Ukraine a couple of years ago. She goes mm -hmm. all over the world promoting this uh, zero waste lifestyle. Why is it becoming important? Why is it rising right now? Well, because people are seeing the devastating effects of the climate crisis that we're in. People are seeing the plastic pollution. Um, you, you cannot drive down the street or walk down the street and not see trash on the ground pretty much anywhere you go, which is very upsetting, I think, to a lot of people. And we see... We definitely see pictures online of animals being suffocated or, or their stomachs full of plastic. Um, I think people, especially thanks to the internet, people are just able to see how plastic pollution and how climate change has affected the entire world. Uh, you know, with, with them finding microplastics in the Alps, like there is literally no part of the world that isn't affected. The bottom of the ocean floor has trash on it every every single bit every single part of this this planet is affected at this point um and i think you know unfortunately while individual people didn't see this coming until recently industries did you know the plastic industry the the people who are creating this plastic they knew they've known for decades what these effects are they they knew the long-term health effects of the chemicals and plastic and how that would leach into our foods um they they knew that they weren't doing they weren't being responsible with the waste management of their products and how it was going to end up littering and, and polluting um so it's it's i think it's very important to keep in mind that that these industries and corporations have been aware and chose not to do anything and now um, 
put millions of dollars into advertising campaigns to make individual people, the consumers feel like it's their fault and it's their responsibility. Um, and absolutely, you know, if, if you choose to throw your trash out the window on, you know, outside, that is a, a bad choice that you made. Um, but it's, it's not the individual people's fault that all of this plastic was created and not managed responsibly in the first place. So individual choices and individual actions are important, but it's also so vital that we hold corporations and industries responsible um, and make them do their part with the resources that they have, because they've got a lot more resources than we do. Right. You know, I have a feeling that I communicate with people who come to me already pre-convinced basically all of my uh, circle all of my connections are in you know more or less environmentally conscious they know about where their products are coming from they try to be more environmentally serious and responsible they studied does it happen to you because it doesn't happen to me at all to convince someone, someone who's like, no, 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 uh, I don't want to hear about minimalism and zero waste lifestyle. You're all inventing, everything is great, everything is fine. Like climate deniers, for example, but this is a mm. little bit, uh, you know, a separate topic. Does it happen to you to have to convince someone or, or educate like gently? Um, educate. Yes, definitely. Convincing sometimes, um, not so much anymore. I think, um, what do you tell the them? What do you tell these people? I feel like you have more exposure since you have this beautiful two businesses, retail and manufacturing. I guess in the retail, you meet more people. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, you know, it's definitely swayed, though, because the people who come into our store in the first place have some sort of interest. Maybe they're just starting out and they need guidance, but they have a willingness to start. And so we definitely don't see um, many people that uh, don't want to uh, don't want to listen or, or are climate deniers even. But because of the. Uh, location that that we're in the, the area the the region of the country we uh, are in a very conservative uh, rural area i would not describe it as progressive um so there's there's a lot of climate deniers here unfortunately um but no luckily we don't have to to really like argue or try to convince people very often and um not me personally anymore either you know i i I'm not the one in the store every day. You know, I have employees that are the ones who are actually talking with people. So um, they they have a, a different experience than than I do because they're they're in it every day. But I'd say for the most part, it's people who who are already interested in starting. Right. Well, you said you are not in the most progressive geographically place. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of uh, another interview I did on jobs in sustainability with Lincoln Blevins, and he said, I respect those who are working in oil and gas industries. I respect those who are working in fast fashion uh, brands because and doing sustainability, trying to integrate it there because mm -hmm. they are doing the hardest job. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. easy to to be in that, you know, white and fluffy and green uh, environment and corporation organization or mm -hmm. geographical location where everybody understands, everybody supports you, everybody's uh, clapping to your efforts. And it's extremely hard to be constantly judged, to be constantly brought, um, you know, exposed and brought into light, like, yeah. H&M sustainability officer is a bad person. No, she's a great person because she she's is trying. there trying yeah. at least. Exactly. Well, that has been an amazing interview. I thank you so much for sharing your story and your knowledge and your ideas and your thoughts. One final question I always ask my guests is what kind of 
one piece of advice you would give to the listeners of Sustainability Explored? Ooh, what a great question. One, <laughs> one piece of advice. Um, I think that everyone has the power to create change in their community. And no matter what's going on in the world or even in your community, um, it's important to remember that you have power as an individual, as a community member, you can make a difference and you just have to find what is most important to you. Um, and it doesn't have to be environmentalism. It doesn't have to be sustainability because actually all these, all the different issues are connected. So maybe what you're passionate about is um, feeding children or you're passionate about um, providing homes to people experiencing homelessness. Whatever issue you really care about, do everything that you can for that and know that you're making a difference and try to get more people on your side doing good things as well because the only way that we are going to create change in the world is if we work together to create change in our communities. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. Best of luck with the business. I hope it goes, it rises up and you convert more and more people on your bright side. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Ciao, ciao. Wow, that was an interview with Kelly. And as always, I really hope you enjoyed listening to it. You learned something new today and you got inspired to take one little action to change your life and the life of your community for the better. If you have any questions to me or Kali, you can find us on LinkedIn. I will leave links uh, in the show notes to Kali's podcast that unfortunately we didn't speak about. The name is Hippie Heaven Podcast and it has a website, hippieheavenpodcast.com. Uh, check her website, her shop site, um, same name, hippieheavenshop.com. If you like the podcast, if you like this episode, you know what to do. Leave a review, like, comment, share on your social media, share with anyone who you think might benefit from hearing this. And finally, reach out to me on LinkedIn, challenge me with your questions or suggest guests or become guests yourself. Suggest also topics you'd like me to cover in the future. And this was Sustainability Explored, episode number 76 season seven, and me, your host, Anna Chashina. Thank you again for listening, for being with us today, and until next time, next Thursday. Take care, stay sustainable. Bye-bye.